So yes, I will be uh, telling you all about how to speed up uh, SHA-1 collision attacks. Um, the award-winning SHA-1 SHA collision attacks due to my co-author, Mark Stevens. Um, so what Mark showed earlier this year is that finding collisions in SHA-1 is possible with the shattered attack. And in fact, the colliding PDFs that uh, they gave in that attack um, can be reused against many targets. So of course, the best practice would be to migrate away from broken crypto, no duh. But as we all know, migration of crypto algorithms is actually difficult in practice. There's interoperability issues, backwards compatibility, the ambiguous and amorphous problem of what you do with all these old signatures for now broken algorithms. And SHA-1 collision, uh, collisions are potential threats for many different applications. As I just mentioned, signatures, there are now GPG, message forgeries. Uh, SVN deduplication actually uses SHA-1, so that's vulnerable to collision attacks. Uh, Git extensively uses SHA-1, and though it's not vulnerable to the shattered PDF, it is, um, it is generally vulnerable to SHA-1 collision attacks. So a solution for this is collision detection. It's a temporary solution that falls under the sort of overarching headline of counter crypt analysis. That is real time detection of crypt analytic attacks. And the idea is that you repair security with a drop in hash function replacement that not only computes the digest, but gives you an answer, was there an attack detected, yes or no? And this works by detecting unavoidable anomalies that are part of crucial attack properties, an internal zero difference that comes up at some point in the hash computation, and that there are only a very few feasible message differences between uh, colliding messages. So this was actually first developed as part of a forensic analysis of the SHA, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the MD5 collision uh, that was used in the uh, super malware flame. So to give you some background on collision attacks, uh, they're attacks on the compression function in a hash function. And so if you have like an identical prefix collision, the way that works is you have two messages, they begin with the same prefix, and then there's some collision blocks or near collision blocks that end up causing a collision. There's the much more dangerous chosen prefix collision attack where you can have two arbitrarily different uh, prefixes that you then do some birthday bits to corral the chaining value to some value that you need it to be, and then you do some collision blocks and near collision blocks to end up uh, with two messages that have the same hash value. So the collision detection algorithm works as follows. We start with an attack class, and that is all attacks, all collisions that have uh, a zero difference at the ith step of the compression function, and this delta b message difference between the uh, colliding blocks. And the detection works as follows. We copy the ith state over. We apply the delta b to the message input. And we compute the virtual second block by computing forward from the ith state, backwards from the ith state to get the initial value, and those are combined to give uh, the output of the compression function, and we just check for identical output. So this will detect all variants of the attack that have a zero difference at step i and the message input difference delta b. Now the whole collision detection algorithm is just that for each block in the message, we have to iterate over all the attack classes and use this collision detection routine. This has a high cost. Every attack class costs an additional hash operation. So SHA-1 is weak. There are at least 14 classes of attacks that it is uh, susceptible to, so we can fix it a little bit. But MD5 is very weak. It has at least 223 classes, so it requires quite a bit of fixing. OK, so this collision detection gives us some strong guarantees. False positives occur with negligible probability. 
uh, our conjecture is that it's 2 to the negative digest length. And we also have no false negatives. That is, assuming that uh, our list of feasible attack classes is sufficiently complete, but that list that we have is based on thorough analyses in the literature. In fact, pretty much all of the last 20 plus years of analysis of MD5 and SHA-1 indicate that the list of attack classes that we're looking at are what is feasible at this time. So now our contribution with this paper is an improved collision detection algorithm. As I stated before, each attack class costs one full compression. And our idea here is to speed that up with unavoidable bit conditions. That is conditions on the message bits that are necessary for an attack class. And the idea is that these UBCs will be uh, we'll be able to verify them quickly and then hopefully most of the time skip the full work of collision detection. And we find these UBCs by analyzing all the feasible attack variants to avoid introducing false negatives. So we have implemented this in a collision detection library that's been released on GitHub as well as the tools that we used in this analysis. Uh, whereas before, the implementation introduced a factor of increase proportional to the number of attack classes. So that was 224 times for MD5, 15 times for SHA-1. The collision detection library that implements the algorithm in this library gives us a less than 1.7 times speed up. And we've in, uh, increased the number of attack classes from 14 attack classes to 32. And this has been deployed uh, in products and services such as Git, uh, it was released in Git 2.13. It's released in Google services and as well as a Microsoft service. Um, in fact, if you try to email one of the colliding PDFs from the shattered attack in Gmail, you'll get this error that you see here that a virus has been detected. So to explain how we derive these UBCs, I'm going to have to give you some background on SHA-1 differential cryptanalysis. So the SHA-1 compression function processes 512-bit chunks of input at a time, and it updates a 160-bit chaining value. So the message block input, that 512-bit input, is linearly expanded from the 512 bits to 80 32-bit words, and these 32-bit words are fed into 80 round compression functions. Now a differential path is how a collision is constructed. It describes the exact differences in the working states and message input. Now the last 60 steps of the SHA compression function are what determines an attack's complexity. And this differential path is used to derive a system of equations that are solved for uh, to give the collision. SHA-1 differential cryptanalysis also has this idea of a disturbance vector that is like a design plan for differential paths. It describes a combination of local collisions, and it's the only way that is compatible to generate these differential paths with the message expansion. There are two feasible known classes of these disturbance vectors, type 1 and type 2, both parameterized by K and B, which are the shifts and rotations. And this gives a zero difference at step k plus 9 in the uh, compression function, and it determines the exact message XOR differences. So how do we use these disturbance vectors to compute unavoidable bit conditions? We start with the disturbance vector. We use that to enumerate all possible differential paths from rounds, 65, from rounds 35 to 64. Now we translate each of these differential paths into an n-dimensional vector equation that lives somewhere in an n-dimensional space. It's also important to note that if a differential path is possible, then its negative is also possible. So that implies that if a vector w is present in this space, then its complement is also present in this space. So then we determine the smallest enveloping affine subspace. It's not a vector space. It's vector space sort of translated off the origin by some displacement. And that gives us n minus k linear equations, which 
are in fact the fast to check unavoidable bit conditions that we wanted. Now all this stuff on the left is the hard part. Uh, this exhaustive analysis using joint local collisions, this is how collision attacks are done and it is backed up by uh, quite a bit of the hash function cryptanalysis literature. The right part is just is easy. It's just linear algebra once you translate those differential paths into the vector equations. So that's all a bit abstract, so let me give you a concrete example of what these unavoidable bit conditions look like. So for this given disturbance vector that we have on the right here, the unavoidable bit conditions are these seven parity equations on the expanded message input. So what we did was we selected the 32 disturbance vectors leading to the lowest complexity attacks and we computed the UBCs from them. So each disturbance vector has seven to 15 UBC equations for a total of 373 overlapping equations. Now we'd like to exploit those overlapping equations to further lower the number of equations that we need to check. Uh, here we have two disturbance vectors and their associated uh, UBCs. And if you look closely, you see that there are no shared parity equations between the two. However, if we take these two equations here, just add them together, doing some linear algebra, that first term cancels out, we get a new equation. We can add that back into the UBC, which is an equivalent set of equations. Um, and in fact, we can remove one of the previous equations. Now, you probably see where this is going. We'll take this, uh, on the right side, we'll take these two equations, add them together, do the same thing, and we end up with the same equation, which we can add back in, removing one of the other equations. So we did a little algebraic manipulation, and we ended up with equivalent UBCs that now share an equation between them. So what we can observe from this is that the set of equations that we use to check a given UBC for a given disturbance vector is not unique. And the disturbance vectors may have these overlapping UBCs. So the question is, can we use those observations to reduce the total number of equations to check? So to answer this, we used a greedy selection algorithm. We enumerated all potential UBC checking equations by taking linear combinations. We count how many disturbance vectors each equation corresponds to, and we order by this count. Now we select the equation prioritizing the highest counts, and we just repeat the selection until the collection of equations contains a set of equations that completely checks each UBC for each disturbance vector. And so the answer to that question we had about can we reduce the number of equations is yes. Before we had 373 UBC equations, and now we end up um, with 156 unique equations, and uh, those correspond from anywhere from one to seven disturbance vectors. And these are all of that simple uh, two-bit parity check form. So now that we have our reduced set of equations that we want to check, the algorithm to check them is simple. We just uh, go through checking each equation, but we now have to keep track of how many, uh, which disturbance vectors each equation corresponds to. And we do that by use of a 32-bit mask. So that's why we increase the number of attack classes that we're checking or disturbance vectors that we're sort of filtering for from 14 to 32 because we have enough space in this mask. Some of those disturbance vectors beyond the first 14 are disturbance vectors that would contribute to a higher complexity uh, collision attack, but we have the space to check them, so why not add them? Now, if one of these UBC equation fails to hold, we use this mask that we have uh, to mask out potentially satisfied UBCs. And so after we've checked all the equations, we end up with a 32-bit word where there's going to be a one bit that corresponds to a disturbance vector with a satisfied UBC. Now, that greedy selection algorithm that I mentioned on the previous slide, that actually, uh, for us, outputs uh, C code for this optimized check. Now, we had this uh, automatically generated code, so we really want to be sure that it works, so how did we test and verify that? We optimized 
uh, we checked the optimized UBC code versus the unoptimized UBC code by just randomly testing many blocks and making sure that they always have the same number of disturbance or the same the same disturbance vectors that they um, satisfy. And we also have known answer tests. We've got the colliding SHA-1 PDFs. Prior to the full SHA-1 collision, we could use the same technique on reduced round uh, SHA-1 collisions. And then for negative tests, we've got random files. So the expected performance that we get, or we expect the performance uh, of this to be a lot better, and we did some analysis of that. The probability that one of those parity equations is satisfied is um, one half. So if we have a UBC with m equations, the probability that it's satisfied is two to the negative m. So given our specific set of 32 disturbance vectors, on average, we expect to only check one full, do one full collision check every 20.2 blocks, or stated another way, per block, we only expect to have to check about 0.049 disturbance vectors. Now, what the expected slowdown this is going to give us over SHA-1 is, is dependent upon the ratio of time that that UBC check takes relative to a SHA-1 block compression. And our experiments measured that at about 0.46 to 0.76 the cost of a SHA-1 compression. And so we put that all together and we expect our implementation to take about one and a half to 1.8 times what a full SHA-1 hash takes. So, what the, so this is the actual performance of the library that we get. This table shows how many two kilobyte messages we can hash uh, per millisecond. And for the collision detection, it also shows the slowdown over the base SHA-1 hashing operation. The rows indicate different compiler architecture combinations. So what we see is that before we had this UBC check, in fact, the slowdown that we saw was anywhere from 30 to 40 times over what regular SHA-1 costs. And then when we add the UBC check, we actually improve this to under 1.7 times. So, and in fact, 1.43 to about 1.66 times. Now, this is better than what we expected. And the reason for that is that that expected performance we got was an overestimate. We wanted to be a little pessimistic in that. Um, there's some technical reasons for that that I won't get into. So now you can say, OK, well, you're comparing against your SHA-1 uh, hashing performance. So maybe you have a bad implementation of SHA-1 that's not as fast. But we had, in fact, tuned our SHA-1 implementation against Git's uh, previous block SHA implementation, which was optimized for performance. So we can be relatively satisfied that this is, you know, performance-wise, as good as deployed, heavily used hashing code. So we also saw that um, we helped contribute this code into the Git code base with the Git developer community. And uh, the performance improvements given by this UBC check really did make the difference between them being able to take this uh, algorithm or not take this algorithm. And it's also worth noting that this all here, this is all pure C. There's no assembler, as you often see in uh, optimized crypto code. So again, we've got this available online on GitHub. It's been deployed in various places. And we have some ongoing work pertaining to this project. So the UBC checks necessarily introduce non-constant timing or non-constant uh, execution, which opens up the potential for side channel attacks. So this UBC checking algorithm is not really amenable to um, hashing secret data, though you often expect to find collisions in publicly available data. 
but still there, you wouldn't really want two different implementations of SHA in a binary, one that you use for public data and one that you use for private data. So we've been investigating performance improvements using SIMD instructions to help our constant time execution. And we're also uh, plan to do assembler implementation to further really push our performance. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have on this. Great. Thanks, Dan. Great. Any, any questions? I, I guess the obvious question is, um, so how sure are you that this really covers all the, all the possible collision attacks? Ah, OK. So the disturbance vectors that we check for SHA-1 really are uh, all known feasible disturbance or all known disturbance vectors that lead to feasible attacks and so that that is the main assumption that we that we have in this collision detection and um, we're fairly sure because those disturbance vectors have been derived over the last 20 years of hash function cryptanalysis so really if there was some other type of collision attack or some other disturbance vectors, uh, you know, these didn't just pop out of nowhere. It's been well, a long in, time in coming. In Flame, we saw a new, a new uh, uh, type of collision, right? Yes, that is true. That was a new, um, that was a new type of collision uh, that was modified so that uh, GPUs could be used to search for the collision. Um, but in fact, that was not a, it was not a new attack class mm -hmm. as we described in that attack class. So um, this approach was developed after that, um, but if it had been developed before, it's fairly certain it still would have been caught by this approach because it wasn't a new attack class. Okay. So. Yeah. Cool. Great. Any other any other questions? Uh, in that case, I'll ask one more question. So um, Intel is actually putting SHA-1 instructions into the processor. Um, so SHA-1, why they're doing it after a collision was found, who knows. But uh, they're putting it into the processor. So that's going to speed up SHA-1 execution uh, mm -hmm. considerably. And how is that going to affect your timing performance? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'll also comment on why, yeah. <laughs> why I think Intel is putting SHA-1 in, because I work at a big company, and I know how things go at big companies. And once you start the train going, it's hard to stop it, right? So it's been a long time coming for them. So. Although you, know. although you realize now instructions can only be added. They can never be removed. So yeah. now we're going to be stuck with SHA-1 for the next thousand years. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, so I have not actually looked at the SHA-1 instructions, so I don't know how they're going to be implemented. If they're implemented like the AES-NI instructions are implemented, where the individual rounds are put into the um, made available, and then you have to sort of implement SHA-1 fully around that, um, that would actually be really helpful to us because we could just put oh. those instructions in our implementation. Um, the collision detection itself like just reuses those round functions. So that would be really useful for us. I, like I said, I haven't looked at the actual instructions. Yeah, I believe that's what they're doing. Oh, cool. OK. Well, yeah, then that will, that's the sort of best case scenario for us. Even if they didn't, we could put, I guess we could draw in like a, like a compression function into our implementation. It would help some, but it wouldn't be as good. But yeah. Cool. Great. Any other, any other questions? OK. In that case, let's thank Dan again.